Welcome to the History Guy Podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories of lesser-known historical events told by Lance Geiger, also known as the History Guy on YouTube. I'm Josh, your host, a writer for the channel and eldest son of the History Guy. We tell all kinds of stories about history, from the modern era to the ancient past, so you never know what we're going to talk about next. One thing you can be sure of, it is history that deserves to be remembered. This episode of Forgotten History is brought to you by Magellan TV, a new type of documentary streaming provider determined to bring you the finest documentaries from around the globe. The Wild West has become legendary in popular memory, filled with gunfights, outlaws, and sheriffs battling it out in a lawless land. The history, of course, is somewhat different. In this episode, the History Guy will talk about two true stories of men in the Wild West and the tumultuous times they lived through. First is the story of Dick Fellows, known as the outlaw who couldn't ride a horse. Charismatic and charming, Fellows made a living out of thievery, but was continually defeated by his demons. Second is the tale of Soapy Smith, a confidence man who swindled money out of men all over the frontier, looking for a place where con men like himself wouldn't get chased out of town. And now allow me to introduce the History Guy. Our vision of the American Wild West is largely driven by film, and if you watch the movies and TV shows of men in white hats and men in black hats, you would think that the Wild West was a wild and lawless place, full of gunslingers and bandits. In reality, the difficulty of life in the Wild West was largely because it was the frontier and people were trying to carve a life out of wild land. It was largely a law-abiding and yet hardscrabble existence. But there were real outlaws in the Wild West, and they were real people with real stories. And perhaps no story of an outlaw in the Wild West better reveals the, the human nature of the people that were outlaws in the Wild West than the extraordinary tale of the bandit, Dick Fellows. Part of what makes Dick Fellows' story so interesting is that he did not start out in life in a way that you might expect for an outlaw bandit. He was born George Lytle in Clay County, Kentucky, likely in 1845 or 1846, and he was the son of a successful attorney and court judge. He grew up with a wealthy and gentrified lifestyle. He was given a good education. He was bright and studied for what promised to be a successful career as a lawyer in Kentucky. His legal studies were interrupted by the U.S. Civil War. He enlisted in the Confederate Army in July of 1863, was captured by the Union in November of 1863, and in December was paroled on the promise that he never again take up arms against the United States. He continued his legal education and was admitted to the bar, and there, with such a promising life in front of him, he ran into the roadblock that would hobble him his entire life. George Lytle was an alcoholic. He drank away his career and his law practice. He ruined his reputation. He embarrassed his family. And his life in ruins in 1867, he quietly left Kentucky. Like many Americans of his time, he went west, moving to the San Fernando Valley area of California. He reinvented himself and changed his name to Dick Fellows. But George Lytle or Dick Fellows, he was still an alcoholic. He was unable to establish a successful law practice, failed at several legitimate businesses, was still simply besotted by alcohol, and finally destitute, he turned for income to stagecoach robbery. His tactic for robbing stagecoaches was surprisingly simple. He would lay in wait on a stagecoach route, and when the stagecoach approached, he would step out a bandana over his face, brandish a pistol, and order the driver to throw down the express box, which usually included a few hundred dollars. It was a simple but surprisingly effective tactic, and yet one that required not insubstantial amount of luck to not get caught. And after several successful robberies, his luck ran out. He was recognized based on a wanted poster, arrested, and sent to San Quentin Prison in 1870. And then Dick Fellows started what would become a pattern in his life. In prison, deprived of alcohol, he was a charming and well-educated fellow. He was contrite and remorseful. He was a model prisoner. He taught other prisoners remedial education. He was such a good prisoner that then California Governor Newton Booth 
pardoned him in 1874, having served just four years of an eight-year sentence. Once again, he tried to succeed in legitimate business. Once again, he returned to alcoholism and his businesses failed. Once again, in reduced circumstances, he resorted to stagecoach robbery. And this is where he built his most famous legend. In 1875, by carefully watching the stage movements, he divined that a certain Wells Fargo stage would be carrying an enormous amount of money that was going to be used for a bank transaction, the astounding sum of $200 $40,000. Planning his robbery, he rented a horse, and racing to the location where he planned to rob the stage, pushing the horse to run, the horse threw him, and he was knocked unconscious for several hours. And that is the life of Dick Fellows. He had, because he was so smart and so clever, found the opportunity and planned what would have been the most lucrative stagecoach robbery in the history of the nation, and he missed his chance because he fell off his horse. And thus began the legend of Dick Fellows, the outlaw who couldn't ride a horse. Not to be deterred, Fellows reasoned that the same stage would be returning back on its route in about a week, and while it wouldn't have nearly as much money, it also wouldn't have armed guards. And on the second try, he successfully robbed that same stage. But when the driver threw down the heavy strong box and rode away, Fellows realized that he had forgotten to bring along any tools that he could use to open the strong box. And when he tried to place the heavy strong box on the horse that he had stolen so that he could rob the stagecoach, the horse bolted and ran away. So here was Dick Fellows in the pitch black night with a heavy strong box knowing that a posse would be chasing him. And in the dark as he tried to get away, he fell in a hole, dropped the strong box on his leg, and broke his leg. Well, eventually he did manage to steal some tools that he could use to open the box and to splint his leg, and he stole a horse on which he hoped to make his getaway with the not insubstantial take of $1,800. But the problem was that the horse that he stole had been newly shod, and the owner, having run out of horseshoes, had temporarily placed a mule shoe on one of the horse's feet, and so the horse left very unique and identifiable tracks that the posse could follow, and once again Dick Fellows was caught and sent to San Quentin Prison. He actually managed a brief escape while he was being transported to the prison, but one more time he was identified because of a wanted poster, and he was sent to San Quentin with a sentence of eight years. Back in San Quentin, and once again deprived of alcohol, Dick Fellows again became a model prisoner who was contrite and remorseful and taught other prisoners remedial education and, in this case, studied and became proficient in Spanish. And once again, he was such a model prisoner that the new California governor, George Perkins, pardoned him in 1881, having served just five years of his eight-year sentence. Again, Dick Fellows tried to make a legitimate living, this time selling himself as a teacher of the Spanish language. But again, he turned to alcoholism and lost his business and once more turned to stagecoach robbery to pay the bills. He successfully robbed a number of stagecoaches in the San Luis Obispo area of California, but one more time he was identified from a wanted poster and was sent back to prison. While being transported to prison, he managed to escape not once, but twice, both times by simply being so charming that he lulled his guards into a false complacency and then running away. The second time, he tried to steal a horse in order to escape, and of course, the horse threw him on the ground, knocking him senseless and allowing him to be captured, a fitting end for the outlaw who could not ride a horse. He was sent to California's Folsom Prison, this time as a repeat offender, with a life sentence. Today, Dick Fellow's name is almost forgotten outside of a few small-town California historical societies, and if he is known, it's for his incompetence, the outlaw who couldn't ride a horse, and both of those facts are really kind of unfair. He did successfully rob more than a dozen stagecoaches and is suspected in many more stagecoach robberies. And he managed some amazing and brazen escapes from law enforcement. In many ways, he was one of the most successful outlaws in the Wild West. 
But much more compellingly, he was just a person that was very, very human. He was intelligent. He was well-educated. By all accounts, he sincerely wanted to live a law-abiding life and yet was continually sabotaged by his addictions. And that is a story that is more human and in many ways much sadder than the black-headed villains that we tend to see in film and on television. Despite his life sentence, Dick Fellows got one more pardon by California Governor James Gillette in 1908. It seems that his wealthy and influential Kentucky family rediscovered and reconciled with him and successfully petitioned the governor to pardon him on the promise that he would return to Kentucky where the family would guarantee his good behavior. And it's there where that wily villain made maybe his last escape. Because there is no record that he ever returned to Kentucky, no proof that he ever lived there, and no evidence that he died there. His ultimate fate is unknown. Just another legend of the Wild West. And now's the part of the episode where we get to talk to the History Guy directly and ask him some questions about the episode that we just listened to. Dick Fellow's story is one that resonates well beyond his time, and I just wanted to know how typical do you think his story is in the Wild West? First of all, not every person who went to the West decided to rob stagecoaches, so you don't want to say that he's too typical. But there are some things in his story that I think are really very typical of the West that are surprising. One of them is that he was an alcoholic, and that story really permeates his entire story. Uh, and it's not to say everybody who came West is an alcoholic, but it is to say that a lot of people went West because something had gone wrong in the East and they were going to the frontier for a new start. And that he was going to the frontier for a new start, uh, I think is very typical of what happened in the West. And that that didn't always work out for him it was also fairly typical, I think, of what happened to a lot of people in the West. And that you could find a new start in the West, uh, that there was actually some freedom there that you didn't have necessarily in the East. I think that's all very typical. Another thing that's surprisingly typical is this idea that he kept getting caught, kept going to prison, uh, and yet kept getting pardons and left out of prison. And that actually happened a surprising amount. As, and that's in the West, you find out a lot of people who were both good guys and bad guys. Dick Fellows didn't happen to be both a lawman and a criminal, which a lot of them were. But uh, it is quite possible there that you would go, you would get arrested, you would get jailed. And then they, you know, the jails were only so large and then they would just let you out and then you would go back to crime. And that was also surprisingly typical of the outlaws of the Wild West. So uh, that stuff, which is not necessarily what you'd see in a Western movie, I think is, is, is typical, is representative of the experience. You mentioned at the beginning of this story that a much more understanding of the Wild West comes from movies. While the stories in movies are exciting, and sometimes maybe even often based on, you know, some kind of truths, what do you think the advantages of learning these stories about these real people in history too? Well, to start, they're really good stories. Uh, they're, they're fun to listen to. And this idea that it has to be fiction for it to be interesting is simply not the case. A lot of the, the times, the, the true story is as fascinating as anything that happens or is, is told in, in a movie. So that's to start with. But the, the second thing is the reason you look at history is to learn who you are as a people and how you came to where you are. And you can't do that with fiction, or at least you can't do that nearly as well with fiction. And so learning the true stories really tells us a lot more about who we are and how we came to be the people that we are today. Before we start the next piece on Soapy Smith, let's talk about the podcast for a second. Now that we've kind of got a couple of these under our belt, I, th I think we can talk a bit about how we're going to continue to experiment with this format and how one of, our, one of our goals is to start making more original content that will be only on the podcast or primarily made for the podcast. You know, we're really excited to start doing podcasts. People have asked us about them in the past, and we think that the content that we've done on YouTube, where we've primarily been, uh, lends itself to podcasts. But on YouTube, uh, one of the things that we have to do is find media pictures to support it because it's a video format. And we've occasionally run into topics where we just don't have media uh, for various reasons. It's in the public domain because we use everything in the public domain. Uh, and there's some of those topics I think lend themselves very well to podcasts. So, so far we've taken episodes we've done on the YouTube channel and we've moved them into the podcast. We've added this conversation that we're having now, which we were missing, which we didn't have in the YouTube channel. So we're already experimenting, but I think we will start to see at least here and there us putting in some topics that don't fit in YouTube that we've looked at and said, you know, it just doesn't work for what we're doing on YouTube. And we'll put them in here 
And I think that's going to be a lot of fun. I think we'll see some stuff, be able to talk about some stuff, maybe some pop culture stuff where almost nothing's going to be in the public domain, but it's still historically important uh, that we'll be able to fit into the podcast and, and just didn't work in the other format. And that's, that's a great point. You know, I know I've got a couple of stories that are, that are kind of set aside because you don't have stuff in the PD. One of the guys that I'm thinking of is Jerry Lawson, who was a video game programmer. And he was kind of one of the, one of the guys who was spearheaded the, the move into cartridges for games. And, you know, that change from where we were doing gaming in arcades to where, you know, now you could take these home, it, it has significantly affected how we live today. I mean, video game consoles, but because he did his work in the 70s and 80s, none of that, none of those photos are in the public domain. And that's so, exactly the sort of topic that we would have looked at and said, this is great, but we can't even show a picture of a video game. It's all under copyright. Uh, that might be a really great fit for the podcast. And so look for those uh, in the future, us doing a few things that we couldn't do uh, using the YouTube channel, which has been our primary way of telling these stories uh, up to now. Magellan TV is sponsoring this episode, and we want to thank them for helping make this podcast possible. And we've kind of spoken about them before, but we just want to talk about kind of what we've been watching lately on Magellan. And I do, I use Magellan all the time. When I talk about Magellan TV or here on the YouTube channel, it's because we really do believe in the product and really do enjoy this made by filmmakers, thousands of documentaries, more than uh, I have time to watch. I, every time I'm there, I'm just like, I want to watch this one and this one and this one. And then, you know, I don't have enough time for it all. And that's, it's great to have that. You don't necessarily, you could spend a lot on a lot of pay channels these days and still flip around and not find anything to watch. And Magellan, you just find everything to watch. One of the ones I want to mention that uh, we did an episode uh, last year about our hospital ships, the Mercy and the Comfort, which have an interesting history. And at the time I watched a very good documentary that's on Magellan that's called Surgery Ship. That's about a current hospital ship. It's called the African or Africa Mercy. Uh, and it goes uh, and does surgery in parts of the world where people just don't have access to those kind of life-changing surgeries to places where they don't have access to that. They don't have a hospital that can do that. So they take top surgeons, they float the hospital to the bay and they're able to go in for a short period of time, identify people and provide these surgeries. It's a fascinating documentary. It shows you how much we can change in the world. Get Magellan TV, go watch the surgery ship. It's called, you'll love it. And it's one of those things that covers the cost of Magellan TV just for that one documentary. Yeah, I will, I will admit I've got quite a few uh, shows on my, my to watch list. Uh, one of the ones that I'm really looking forward to is, is, I think it's a more recent one and it's talking about like the, the verdict of history. And it talks about a number of World War II folks. So Stalin and Himmler and, uh, I think that the verdict has been pretty clear on some of them, but it also talks about like Roosevelt and Eisenhower. And I'm kind of interested to see on kind of what they're, what they want to talk about with that. They've got space. They've got uh, true crime. Uh, they've got actually some uh, drama on there, uh, the historical drama and stuff like that. And so, yeah, I mean, I just love documentaries. I love learning about mathematics. I love learning about biography. Uh, there's some sports documentaries on there that are just surprising to me. So it's not just history. Uh, I love history and I think it's probably the best history content you're going to find anywhere, but there's also all sorts of things. And if you love history, then you probably are interested in things like space, which ties back to it. And so there's plenty on there beyond the history genre that say it's just worth your time. If you like to watch nonfiction television, if you want to learn things when you're watching TV, then that's a great place for you to go Magellan TV. We also have a special deal out there for History Guy listeners. If you go to try.magellantv.com slash thehistoryguy, there's always a deal. Usually you're going to get a free month of Magellan TV just to get you started. Sign up. You'll be glad you did. Next, we're going to hear the History Guy talk about Soapy Smith, a very bad man who spent his life on the edge of the frontier, always looking for a new way to swindle someone. And stay tuned after the episode to hear us talk a little bit about Soapy. I have occasionally been asked why bad people and bad acts deserve to be remembered. Shouldn't some history be forgotten? For me, the simple answer that it's history is sufficient. But there are other reasons. One of the reasons for remembering history is as a cautionary tale. Bad people and events need to be remembered so that they are not so easily repeated. For some bad people, their acts are so extraordinary that it leads you to wonder what they might have accomplished had they applied themselves to different pursuits. And sometimes it's just a good story, a ripping yarn that reminds us that history does not have to be boring. Maybe all of those apply to Jefferson Smith, a decidedly bad man who, nonetheless, deserves to be remembered. 
Jefferson Randolph Smith II was born in Georgia in 1860. His father was a lawyer and his family was wealthy. He developed the manners of a southern gentleman, but the family wealth was lost in the Civil War and his alcoholic father struggled to support his family. They moved around, winding up in Texas in 1875. It was in Texas that Jefferson apparently began first in sales and slowly moved into confidence tricks. Smith was a good fit for a confidence man. While not necessarily handsome, his southern genteel manner and accent were disarming, and he had a silver tongue. He had exceptional dexterity and a sharp mind. He would master the trade. The newspaper, the San Francisco Call, would later say of him, there's not a trick known to confidence men in which Soapy was not expert. He made an early living on the bread and butter of the trade, the shell game, a similar game called three-card Monty, or just cheating at poker using marked cards. He was good at it. He would use shills, accomplices, to make the games look real and get people to up their bets. But these types of cons, called short cons, meaning fast swindles, had their limits. A confidence man had to keep moving before the locals got wise to his tricks or too angry at their losses. It was an itinerant life. Smith spent years traveling from town to town. But he found new opportunities in the Colorado town of Leadville. When Jeff Smith arrived in Leadville around 1885, it was a busy silver mining town, a rough and tumble town that had already attracted famous gamblers like Doc Holliday and Alice Ivers, also known as Poker Alice. Being a boom town, Leadville was a wild place that, while not completely without law and order, was largely untamed. The advantage of a town like Leadville is that it was always getting a new influx of miners seeking their fortune. A con man could find new suckers without having to leave town. By some accounts, it was in Leadville that Smith learned and then perfected the con for which he is most famous, the soap swindle. The game was fairly simple. Smith offered passers-by a chance to buy soap at a very high price, $5 a bar, claiming that he had put some money, 50 or even $100, in the packaging of some of the bars. A person could buy a bar of soap for $5 with a chance of striking it rich, and if they didn't find money, well, at least they'd have soap. The scam works much like the shell game. Shills are used to make it appear real, and once they see the money, the suckers buy up all the soap at far more than its value. Smith became so associated with the scam that it earned him the nickname Soapy. When he was finally arrested for the scam in Leadville, the sheriff who arrested him forgot to ask his first name, and so wrote Soapy on the arrest warrant, and the nickname stuck. But the arrest marked the end of the scam in Leadville, and Soapy had to move on. He became determined to find a place where a confidence man could operate without being constantly forced to move on. His goal was not just to play the con, but to build a network of fellow cons, thugs, bribed and coerced officers and officials that allowed him to operate without fear of arrest. He found that place in Denver, Colorado. In Denver, Smith built a gang that slowly took over the city's criminal element. For all the scams, both short and long, half the money went to Soapy. He used the money not just to bribe police, judges, and elected officials. By 1889, newspapers claimed he was bribing both the mayor and the chief of police. He also had people like bankers on his payroll who would help him to identify wealthy targets for their scams. His gang did not just include a wide array of grifters, but also people skilled at finding and steering potential victims to the various scams. The steerers used a number of tools, including so-called grip men. Gripman had, through years of practice and research, learned the hand signals of various lodges and secret orders that were common in America. Using those, they could gain a person's trust and then send them off to a dishonest casino or one of several businesses that were fronts for various scams. A victim of such a man later described how one of Soapy's Gripman drew him into a scam where he lent money to a stranger. I just entered the Knights of Pythias. One of the strangers saw my pen and gave me the grip of the order. I felt very brotherly. The gang also kept barbers on the payroll. The barbers not only played their own short con, a bait and switch where they promised a cheap shave and cut and ran up the prices with extra amenities, but they would also strike up conversations with the new customers. If they found out things suggesting the men had money to take, they would cut a small notch in the back of their hair that soapy steers could recognize. By some accounts, this was the origin of using the term mark to refer to the target of a crime. Soapy managed the gang to keep the scams to a level that did not draw too much scrutiny. He was always a supporter of law and order, so long as it kept away all crime but his own. He built community trust via donations to community causes and events. As his influence grew, more gang members came to him. He maintained their loyalty by providing his, using his connections if they got arrested, always paying their bail and attorney costs. Another bit of Smith's personality emerged. He could be randomly generous. 
Donations to widows and orphans funds and to build churches may have been to build trust with the community or to protect his rackets. But if he ran into someone on the street who was down and out, he might buy them a meal or a new coat. One reporter who had actually clashed with Smith recalled seeing him in the street. Smith noticed the man's hat was worn and bought him a new one. When he asked why, Stopey said that he'd won some money gambling and he was on his way to the bank to deposit it and wanted to try to spend as much as possible before he could get there. Author Stanley Sauerwine speculated in his 2018 book, One Trick Too Many, that this was because of superstition among con men, often ascribed to the famous riverboat swindler Canada Bill Jones. If you help someone truly in need, the superstition goes, you would be rewarded a hundredfold. This was called Bill's Luck. He was not generally an unpleasant man. The Lancaster News of Lancaster, South Carolina described him as a most genial and affable crook. But he also had a temper, was not afraid of violence. He was known to have been involved in numerous fights and altercations with other gamblers who were victims of his scams. A November 1818 edition of the Santa Fe New Mexican reported on a near gunfight in Denver between Smith and a gambler named Pomeroy. When Pomeroy drew a gun on Soapy, the newspaper reported, the latter did not appear to be frightened and pulled his gun from his hip pocket. The newspaper concluded, what might have happened had not bystanders seized the two men and disarmed them. The danger of his temper was demonstrated in 1889. A newspaper editor named John Arkins, who had been a colonel during the Civil War, began a crusade against Soapy's corruption. Arkins went so far as to point out where Soapy Smith's family resided. And since, Soapy and a large gang member called Banjo Parker attacked Arkins as he left his office at the Rocky Mountain News. Soapy beat the colonel nearly to death with a weighted cane. Charged with attempted murder, a friendly judge gave Soapy a relatively low thousand dollar bail and he skipped town. The gang had gotten too brazen and a reform movement took over the town. Smith moved his family to St. Louis and laid low. But without Soapy in charge, the criminal element in Denver became more violent. The reform wave subsided and he was quietly asked to come back. When he returned, he became even more brazen. Sauerwein explained that Smith's gambling establishments were so dishonest that when he was accused of bilking customers and contributing to the city's moral decline, he replied that his operation so cheated people that it served as an educational tool to break them of their gambling habit. In 1892, Soapy and his gang took advantage of a silver boom in the Colorado mountain town of Creed. Using lessons learned in Denver, he quickly took over the town's criminal element. An April 1892 issue of the Sioux City Journal described Soapy raising a gang to force some Sioux City gamblers from setting up a gambling establishment. The confrontation led to a gunfight and the Sioux City crew quickly left town. Soapy acted the leading citizen, even bringing on his sister's husband, a noted Texas lawman, as town marshal. He brought the lawless town to heel, reducing street violence, while allowing Soapy and his band to scam the newcomers, hoping to strike it rich for every dime they had. An April 1892 edition of the Topeka newspaper Kansas Farmer described how Creed worked. Soapy Smith was a very bad man indeed and hired at least 12 men to lead the prospector with a little money or the tenderfoot who had just arrived up to the numerous tables in his gambling saloon, where they were robbed in various ways and so openly that they deserved to lose all that was taken from them. As the Creed boom slowed, Smith went back to Denver, where he became involved in a fight between reformist Colorado Governor Davis Hanson Waite and officials of the Denver Fire and Police Boards. When Waite fired two of the board members in an attempt to overturn corruption and put an end to illegal gambling, it sparked a confrontation. The disgruntled officials barricaded themselves in City Hall, and Waite deployed the state militia. The matter was decided in the courts without bloodshed, but Smith had, in the crisis, managed to become deputized as part of a special police force called up by the mayor of Denver to defend City Hall. As the reformers started to shut down gambling in Colorado, Smith even managed to take advantage of that. The deputy would raid his own underground gambling dens, forcing patrons to flee, leaving the money that they had bet behind. But there was another opportunity about to open up. In 1896, gold was discovered in the Klondike region of Canada's Yukon Territory. Soapy sought to draw miners to the remote territory as a golden opportunity. As the newspaper, the San Francisco Call, described it, then he went to Alaska, and from the moment of his arrival there, his record was one of crime and violence. Soapy and members of his gang moved to Skagway, a muddy boom town port in Alaska that was one of the few getaways to the Klondike. It was nearly lawless, in disputed territory between the U.S. and Canada, and bustling with hordes of adventurers hoping to strike it rich. All of the men that Soapy and his gang hoped to separate from their money. He used all the tricks he'd learned in Denver. He became a leading citizen, befriended local, befriended local businessmen, 
donated to civic causes and was charitable to the poor, even if he was the reason they were poor. Newspapers branded him the uncrowned king of Skagway. His gang fleeced the crowds with shell gangs and three-card Monty. His steers met men at the docks, posing as ministers or grizzled veteran miners offering advice. They led them to Soapy's gambling parlor or one of his dishonest businesses. A telegraph office charged them $5 to send a telegraph home, saying that they had made it safely. The return telegraph was another $5. Both were fake. The wires ran into the bay. The telegraph didn't reach Skagway until 1901. Those who complained had little recourse. The only law in town was one U.S. Marshal, and he was on Soapy's payroll. When a vigilance committee arose to threaten his operation, he raised an even larger law and order society and intimidated them away. When the Spanish-American War started, he created a local militia with him at its head. On July 4, 1898, he rode at their head in the town parade. But the confidence man's gang took a step too far when they robbed a miner named John Douglas Stewart three days later. Stewart was one of the first of the Klondike miners to be heading back to the U.S. having struck it rich. The gang parted him from his sack of gold by tricking him in a game of three-card Monty. When he pulled out his sack of gold dust, a gang member simply grabbed it and ran away. This theft, after so many, upset the town for a specific reason. Robbing a successful miner was different than taking some greenhorn's stake. If word got out that miners who had found gold were being robbed in Skagway, the men about to return home might choose a different route, depriving Skagway of their business. On the evening of July 8th, a group of vigilantes met. Soapy took a rifle and went to confront them. He was denied entry by Frank H. Reed, the town surveyor. Accounts differ as to what happened next. Neither man seemed to have had deadly intent, but after a short argument, Smith shot Reed through the groin with his rifle, and Smith was shot through the heart most likely by another vigilante named Jesse Murphy, killing him instantly. Smith's last words were reported to have been, For God's sake, don't shoot! Reed died of his wound twelve days later. The town treated him as a hero, and his funeral was the largest in the town history. As for Fred Smith, many wanted to simply throw his corpse in the river. A funeral was finally held, but the Baptist and Methodist ministers refused to officiate. The town would not let him be buried on consecrated ground, and buried him a few feet outside the cemetery. His gang was run out of town or arrested. Both Reed's and Smith's graves are now visited by tourists in Skagway. It was a stunning fall from grace for the man who had ridden at the front of the parade just four days earlier. The character of Soapy Smith has been in several films, and the 1941 Clark Gable film Honky Tonk was based on a biography of Smith, although the studio was not allowed to use his name. An annual charity costume party called the Soapy Smith Party is held in Hollywood. And you can hire his great-grandson, Jeff Smith, who gives talks about his colorful ancestor's life, and about whom he has also written a book. It's difficult to divine a lesson from a man who, although complex, most agreed was a scoundrel and a very bad man. The story of his life is unquestionably a ripping yarn, and his violent death a cautionary tale about the inevitable result of a life of crime. The headlines at the time read, He died with his boots on. For a man like Jefferson Smith, that is as appropriate an epithet as could be. Ah, Soapy Smith. I like this episode for a lot of reasons, but one of them is that you highlight that he was not a good guy. And I mean, he is a bad guy, but in some ways he's kind of a more mundane, almost everyday bad guy than a lot of the worst people in history. And of course, I mean, the, the most bad, the worst people in history are sure to be remembered. You mentioned that we can learn a lot about what not to be from Soapy, but in a historical sense, there's quite a lot we can learn too. What do you think Soapy's life teaches us about, for instance, life on the frontier? It's, and, and I would start off with, uh, Soapy Smith's a very bad man. Matter of fact, that's the name of the episode. I mean, he was kind of shameless about the way that he uh, would take things from people. Uh, and sometimes it's kind of hard to talk about him being on the frontier. You, I, it, we're crossing the line there. Was Denver really the Wild West? Uh, in 1900, or was Denver as, as cosmopolitan as things that you were finding on the East Coast? So, uh, you do find on the frontier that he was still looking for places that were relatively lawless. Uh, he was often looking for places because he wanted to be able to stay for places where there was a population that was kind of coming through and so that he could keep scamming new people. And you learn that that's how the West kind of worked, that even in, in 1900, there were people that go out looking at venturing in places like Creed. Uh, and many of them, because uh, because the Wild West was being tamed, came in much more greenhorn than they might have come in before. And he was able to take advantage of those people. Uh, but you also learn uh, that as you as you as you're moving from 
the Wild West into the more cosmopolitan 20th century, uh, uh, you learn that there, people were still carrying the trust that they carried from the frontier into a society where uh, there were many more opportunities to take advantage of them. And that's one of the interesting stories of Soapy Smith. He, if anything else, he understood his audience and he knew how to take that, you know, what motivated that audience and how to take them. But it's very telling. Uh, that even though he had been the king of Denver, uh, that he ran into lots of different troubles there because it would come up with reform movements, that he realized that there was much more opportunity to go to Alaska, where it was truly the frontier and there was very little law, and to apply the lessons he learned in Denver in a place where he didn't really have to worry nearly as much about uh, the, the reform movements and the civilization catching up with him. I mean, there's some of that that's uh, really kind of parallel with stuff that we saw during the mobster era too. And that one of the things that he did in Denver is that he was, you know, he was corrupt, but he put a cap on it. Uh, and he knew what stuff would really enrage the public. And he put a cap on that too. And, and he even used law enforcement to do that. And so he, he kind of learned that lesson about how to keep crime in the place where you can be committing crime, but it just didn't go too far. And so you do see sometimes mobsters in the mobster era that would, that would, they would go too far and they would have to leave town for a while and then they could come back and take control again. Or like Soapy Smith, when he left, things got so much worse that they're like, would you come back, take control of the criminal element? Because we like your criminal element better than the criminal element that we had without you uh, because they couldn't get rid of the criminal element. It's all, it, that's all an interesting story. Uh, so it, it is telling where he was at, the, at that spot in time that you could have cosmopolitan Denver and then you could have, still have a silver town rise up in Creed. The, the frontier is disappearing, but it's, it's still there and he's chasing that frontier. Some of it is kind of uh, uh, you know, looking forward to the mobster era and some of it is kind of looking back at the outlaw era and he's this guy that's just sort of in between. But uh, when you talk about the frontier, though, and you talk about the end of his career, which is what he was doing up uh, in the Klondike, uh, you can really see how different it was, how different the law was. Matter of fact, part of what he was able to do up there is because there was a disagreement between the United States and Canada over who had authority there. And so there was really very little law. There was one marshal. The marshal usually was working for Soapy. And we just said that, that simple line that crossed, if you make it so that the people who have struck it rich don't want to come here, then you ruin all of us. And then that, that instant, man, it just flipped like a flip of a switch and he was dead on the ground. Thank you for listening to this episode of the History Guy podcast. We hope you enjoyed these stories of forgotten history. And if you did, you can find more on our YouTube channel at The History Guy. History deserves to be remembered. We will continue to release podcasts every other week. So stick around if you want more podcasts on forgotten history. You can also find us on our website, thehistoryguy.net, and on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Rumble, and Patreon. You can even get a personalized message from the History Guy himself on Cameo.